Tired of dealing with vein disease? Have your symptoms gotten worse? Oh, these spider veins are ugly. My legs and ankles are always swollen. My legs are tired of standing all day. While some symptoms can be managed by lifestyle changes, other factors are out of your control. Get help from the experts at Vein Clinics of Hawaii. To learn more about your treatment options, call 427-5565 or visit veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Aloha, Hawaii. It's time for the Vein Clinics of Hawaii radio show. Their team's approach to diagnosing problems and developing solutions and treatment plans are beyond compare. So let's get started with your host of the show, Mike Buck, and medical director, Dr. Randall Julif of the Vein Clinics of Hawaii. Okay, you've heard the expression uh, in the wintertime, vein, uh, rain, rain, go away. <laughs> I'm going to write a new song for Dr. Julef. Uh, vein, vein, go away. And, you know, that's what happens. That's what the treatment of vein disease is. I'm not only the happy host of the show, but a happy patient. And I, I love reporting uh, some of my own things. And, and usually what happens is when we're going to do one of these shows, Doc usually sends me advance warning about some of the things we're talking about so I can figure out a way to be clever because I, I, I need a lot of help in that area. Anyway, today... Uh, if you've been around in previous shows, you know, we try to cover the entire gamut of vein uh, disease and treatment. And one of the things that you've heard us talk about before is is uh, 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 venous insufficiency. And today, something called post-thrombotic uh, syndrome. Uh, I love syndromes, particularly because this particular case study is a guy that, uh, who knows, might be my cousin. A 77-year-old male. And, you know... Uh, when we talk about this, guys, if you're sitting around just ready to bolt out into the yard because it's time for mom's vein show, <laughs> surprise, this is your vein show today. And I think that's great, Doc, because every time I've been to your office, and you mentioned this before, well, it's the vein, um, certainly spider veins and, 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 and cosmetic things, uh, the women probably lead the men a little bit. But not in this case. In this case, you've got a, I, I, your office is guy-friendly, and it has to be because there's a lot of guys there, huh? Yeah, we, uh, we, we, we see a lot of men, for mm-hmm. sure. And, uh, yeah, I think that's probably a you know, misconception that many people have about, uh, you know, gender in yeah. vein disease. Yeah. I think a lot of people think, uh, oh, you know, veins, that's something the women yeah, get. Yeah. And uh, statistically, uh, women, it, it is a little more common in women, uh, but, uh, but not a lot yeah. more common. And I got to tell you, I don't know if it's just uh, this area. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, or our setting or whatever. But yeah, I, I, I often look around and I say, we, it's got to be 50% men that, yeah. that are coming. And, and you know what? I, I got to agree with you. First of all, almost all of our practitioners, uh, we have a great medical school here and, and lots of opportunities, but certainly a lot of physicians like yourself came to Hawaii for the obvious reason. Everybody comes to Hawaii, check it out. And, and then I think you're right. I think it's not just the setting, but you know, right now on the on the mainland U.S., they're going through winter, and, mm-hmm. you know, and and uh, we have summer and almost summer, so that means we're outside yeah. a lot. Yeah. And isn't that probably uh, because the, the the veins on a lot of men are really for long parts of the year on the mainland not visible? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's probably part even, of it. even even yeah, to pr- themselves. Yeah, you know? right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, to to themselves and to family members who might you know say, "Gee, you know, what's that on your leg? Why don't you get a, go get it looked at." Um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's very common in men. I, we, again, I, I think that uh, sometimes I, I feel it's gotta be at least 50%. Yeah. I Uh, I notice that. And actually, you know, uh, in my own experience, the, I, I find young males and and by that, I mean, you know, in their, you know, twenties, mid yeah, to late yeah. later 20s those are the people that i see the the uh, most extensive varicose vein kind of Isn't situations that, yeah you know, it's it, crazy. it could be it could be specifically in the hospitality of business mm-hmm. and in the tourism business and and i guess that a lot of these things are because of other kinds of trauma that people go through yeah. uh, that that if you're wearing a shorts and a t-shirt around half the day you're a trainer or a a, a an outdoor person uh you get noticed or you mm. notice yourselves hey doc, yeah you know uh let's let's decide which of these are cosmetic 
and take them away, and then let's talk about the rest of them. So that's why I was really interested. This guy's 77. Right. And um, and I don't even know what the uh, post-thrombotic <laughs> syndrome is, but I'm going to learn. Yes, yeah. yeah. And you said it well, so that's yeah. the main thing. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, post-thrombotic syndrome is something that happens um, uh, after somebody has a DVT. So, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, venous thrombosis uh, here because it's, you know, one of those things that can be fatal mm-hmm. in, in certain situations. But uh, and it uh, sometimes, unfortunately, it goes, mis- uh, you know, either misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, if we don't treat it, if we don't find out you know, when it happens and if we don't treat it appropriately, yeah. it can turn into yeah. a much, you know, bigger problem that that essentially, that yeah. essentially lasts a lifetime. And that's what this post-thrombotic syndrome is all about. You know, if uh, people, can, people can suffer a DVT, you know, have a blood clot, and if we treat it appropriately, they can get over yeah. it and often uh, they do fine, you know, yeah. with very and, few repercussions. And, and I must tell you, you know, I think a lot of this is to, is to the credit of late night or just regular television because we see so many more of these things now than we used to be. And I agree. It, it's been very encouraging, mostly be of people that are pushing some sort of medicine or other, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. uh, with regards. To, but but the, isn't the interesting thing is once you've had a DVD, a DVT and, and you get it, examined, diagnosed, and treated, then you are more likely to be able to notice some of the symptoms or some of the conditions before you get another one that's bad. Sure. Yeah. That's very encouraging, isn't it, for most people yeah, to know yeah. that, yeah, you told me you'll fix this, but because I got it, yeah. I'm likely to get them again. So let's right. keep an eye on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, a couple of things there, for sure. Um, you know, once you have a DVT, uh, your likelihood of having another one goes up. You know, it's not the same as the general population anymore. You're mm-hmm. you're at risk for developing another DVT. And if you understand that, yeah. then you will be able to take precautionary measures when you yeah. might be putting yourself in a situation where, uh, you know, blood, yeah, yeah. blood clot formation is a risk, like, uh, you know, jumping on an airplane and staying on it for, you know, five or six you, hours. You know, I'm glad you said that because another thing that comes up every now and again when I talk to friends and other listeners that, that listen to our show, uh, as it says, you know, you guys talk about things that are really practical and really, you know, uh, have to do a lot to be with observation. And when you talk about if you encouraged uh, better better behavior in one area like diabetes or, or, or you know, being overweight or mm-hmm. being, that, that if you take control of that, one of the side benefits are is this other longer taking disease to develop is not going to probably get you as bad as it would if you if you remained obese or type 2 diabetic, et cetera. Right, right. Or, or smoking and all of the things. Sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah obesity in particular. Yeah. Uh, you know, people uh, with obesity uh, have all sorts of vein, vein issues in, you know, lymphedema, yeah. which is something that goes along with, uh, you know, venous insufficiency. So, um, yeah, for sure. Uh, so anyway, yeah, th- this patient uh, came into the office uh, a while back. I think it was about a year ago that mm-hmm. he came in. Uh, and a 77-year-old gentleman. He had a history of uh, high blood pressure, and he was being treated for uh, cholesterol. So mm-hmm. he was on medications for those two things. Otherwise, he was pretty healthy. He had had a stroke at some point yeah. in the past, but um, that stroke he got over, yeah. and he wasn't really affected too much by that anymore but uh, and he was he was still working mm-hmm. he was a very active guy he owned a business uh and uh, you know he went into the office every day and yeah. uh you know so otherwise he was leading a very active and uh you know fairly healthy lifestyle uh but over the prior several years before he came in to see us he was having uh, worsening symptoms in his legs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when he came in, he said uh, he, he was complaining of achiness, heaviness, muscle cramping, and swelling. And those, uh, of course, we know by now are very, very common yep. symptoms of uh, vein disease in one way or another. I, I'm, so, I'm looking for a mirror because I look in the mirror. There, yeah. there, there go I. You yeah. Know, yeah. yeah. So, um, but it, it, with respect to the swelling, uh, the swelling was much more, much more pronounced on one side, on his right mm-hmm. side. Mm-hmm. So he had, you know, he had legs that were probably consistent with some extent of venous disease okay. in one way or another. 
but it looked like he had a lot more going on on the right, in the right leg. Uh, and that's really what he came in for. The swelling was his main complaint. Uh, you know, he had other signs uh, of, uh, you know, he had the pigmentation yeah. and that kind of thing that we see that goes along with venous insufficiency. But his main concern was swelling. And, you know, gee, Doc, why is my right leg always swollen? Yeah, yeah. So um, he, uh, again, he also had some skin changes that we are, you know, that we recognize as being consistent with uh, venous insufficiency. On the left, which was his better leg, he had just mild pigmentation. On the right, he had fairly marked hyperpigmentation of the skin of the lower leg, and uh, it went up, uh, you know, at least half, uh, probably a little yeah. more than half of the calf on the right side. Uh, and again, this is uh, not only is it a yeah. sign of venous insufficiency, but it's all, it's a sign of advanced you know, yeah. advanced problems that have probably been yeah. there for a while. You know, I, I got to tell you that in, in a couple of programs ago, we were talking about this very subject, and that was how many people try to somehow self-diagnose and justify, oh, it's sunburn. Right. You know, I'm out in my yard all the time. My legs are always red, but that's because I'm picking weeds. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's because you have a problem. <laughs> yeah. But but I, I do know that almost everybody wants to figure out they can – uh, that they can figure it out. I mean, whether mm -hmm. they go online or whether they ask a neighbor. But it when you start slowly but surely eliminating the, the, the causes that you think, it really becomes almost imperative that you seek help from somebody greater than Google. Right. <laughs> Dr. Google. <laughs> Dr. Google, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, along those lines, yeah, the, the, the being out in the sun is, you know, one way that people rationalize that. Also diabetes. I mean, you yeah. know, people, uh, we hear this all the time where they come in, they have that uh, darkish uh, pigmentation of the lower leg and they said, oh, that, I'm chalking that up to my diabetes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, often it's, uh, if, it's a sign of advanced venous uh, problems. But so he also, in addition to the pigmentation he had thickening of the skin the skin and this is on the right side only mm -hmm. the skin was thickened it was dry it was scaly uh and uh it it, it had a rashy kind of appearance to it and uh, and again that's something also that goes along with venous insufficiency we call that venous eczema mm -hmm. uh and we call it venous eczema because it venous looks skin. a little yeah, it looks yeah. a little bit like eczema in, you mm -hmm. know other parts of the body but it's not a dermatologic problem it's a you know, primarily a venous problem. You, you've, by the way, mentioned in the past, and Dr. Julev is the medical director of Vein Clinics of Hawaii, and everything that we're talking about, you can see at veinclinicsofhawaii.com. They're spending a lot of time making it a very friendly uh, website, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. What you talk about when you start seeing it, uh, uh, and, and, and it's only happening to one leg, mm -hmm. um, is, is that sort of a wake-up call to a lot of the patients, the reason why they come looking in the first place? Yeah. Just I, I, one leg is... No, first of all, isn't always one leg's going to be a little bit bigger than the other one anyway, but maybe not noticeably bigger. Right. You know, in, in my case, it was like a one-inch difference and 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 I couldn't and it didn't look swollen and looked the same. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's probably not unusual for mm -hmm. you know the legs to be a little different in mm -hmm. size, but but not pronounced for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, swelling mm -hmm. is uh, swelling is a common problem that people come in to see us for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they may have other symptoms, but they're concerned about the swelling. Uh, but yeah, you're right. When one leg is more, even more swollen, yeah, uh, yeah that that uh, increases their anxiety level even more for sure. You know, some people, real quickly, I know you have a lot of ground to cover, but I'm just curious about this, and that is, uh, if you are managing it. Uh, you're still swollen, but maybe not look it. You know what I mean? If you're using, you know, diet and exercise and, and compression and elevation and all of these things. Um, and you think, gee, not, it, it, it's looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. But it's looking pretty good because you're doing all these things to it. Right. You know, does it ever heal? Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean that there's nothing wrong underneath it all? Yeah, yeah. No, not That's necessarily. That's the scary part to me. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he had never developed an ulcer, although his skin... Uh, in especially in that right leg was kind of moving in that direction like he could go there you know mm -hmm. we talk we talk about the classification uh, levels and um, he was uh, he was what would be called referred to as a c4 okay. um, class so, four. yeah yep. classification yep. four uh, you know out of on, six. on that scale yeah. of six yeah. 
And, uh, you know, when, when people reach the C4 level, we, you know, we get more concerned about them mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, that, that is the area where the skin changes are really starting. And he was probably in adva- there's two levels of C4, there's mm-hmm. A and B, and he was definitely into the, into the B section. So he was heading in the direction of, uh, possibly developing an ulcer at some point in the not too distant future. It so, must be exciting for, uh, for people, for surgeons like you to get one of those cases and know boy this is a classic c4 right here and boy we we know exactly what to do for this guy based on we know where he is in the progression right yeah exactly yeah. so um so in the now so the other the other thing is getting back to the fact that you know one leg was much more swollen than the other is that something that starts to you know send up red flags for us yeah uh, that sends up, uh, you know, uh, questions, you know, many more questions as to what's going on here, because, uh, you know, most people, even if they have venous insufficiency or whatever, uh, you know, or, or some other medical problem that's leading yeah. to swelling, you know, most of the time it's symmetrical. Most of the time, you know, swelling is the same on one side or the other. Uh, and uh, if it's uh, more, more, much more pronounced on one side, then there's a reason for mm-hmm. it and we got to figure it out. So, you know, what, what are some of the things that, you know, cross our mind when we see that as a problem? Um, and, uh, you know, so the, the, uh, is there a, que- or there's, you know, often a question of lymphedema. Mm-hmm. You know, lymphedema is, uh, is a cause for swelling. Uh, it has to do with the lymphatics and the lymphatics carry the clear fluid that is in our body. Uh, you know, is it a, is it a lymphatic problem? Uh, it was uh, something that we would call lymphedema and people with lymphedema in just one yeah, limb, yeah, you know, yeah. they, that also people with lymphedema, most of the time is symmetrical, but if it's just in one limb, you know, we start to uh, ask questions like, well, did you have surgery? I was going to say prior surgery, you mentioned the, that before. On yeah. the leg yeah. or, you know, on some uh, pelvic or mm-hmm. intra-abdominal organ, did you have, pri- did you have cancer and did you have prior radiation to you know, the uh, area of the body where lymphatics might be concentrated uh, because those are things that can uh, lead to one leg becoming much more swollen than the other. But by the way, I've seen some people, and this was on a trip uh, to one of the periodicals I was reading in doctor's office when I was waiting for uh, my turn, which is, by the way, never very, uh, you don't wait very long to get it. They got the treatments pretty well planned out at Van Clinics of Hawaii. Uh, But I saw that thing, and that was... um, um, a, I, I guess there'd been some sort of a blockage or something, and, and there was one leg, and it wasn't a little bit bigger; it was a lot bigger than the other. Yeah, you know, and and, and I'm I'm I remember when I was a little kid, a friend of mine had polio, and later on, and now that's a, a, a disease that's been handled, but later on, he never did grow into having two legs the same size. Mm, yeah. He didn't slow him down much. He was still in pretty good shape. He was athletic. Right. But but that does, I mean, you, and I know you see it all. There is sometimes a huge difference between the circumference or diameter of one leg than the other. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, you know, there's a reason yeah, for that. Yeah. And we got to, it behooves yeah. us to figure it out. But so, uh, it, so there's, there's that situation. Is it a lymphatic problem? You, you know, is it venous and lymphatic? Um, or is is there some, or, or is there a blockage? Is there kind of an, a downstream block mm-hmm. to venous flow? Uh, for instance, did the patient have a DVT at some point in the okay. past? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, did he have an extensive DVT that maybe extended higher, you know, just not, no. not in the leg only, but also into the pelvis? Um, there's something called May Thurner syndrome. Yeah, I saw that in your notes, and, and sound, that sounds really interesting. What is yeah, that? Yeah, we and we've we've uh, we've talked about that a little mm-hmm. bit in the past, and you know, May Thurner is a uh, an obstruction to venous flow, uh, a large pelvic vein. Usually, it affects the left side, hmm. the left leg more so than the right, uh, and it has to do with one of the uh, you know main arterial blood vessels in our pelvis that is actually hmm. uh, laying on top of an impinging flow in the vein. So uh, you know that's a pretty specific problem, but it's something uh-huh. that we think about when we see a person with uh, you know just w- with one leg that's uh, larger than the other, and in this case, uh, it would be the left. This guy's right leg was the 
the uh, the bigger one. Is that where the 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 term May Thurmer comes from? May Thurner um, are names I think of two yeah, yeah. two different physicians mm-hmm. that uh, yeah. you know you've investigated it. But so or or is there something else? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. is there a pelvic mass yeah. or you know uh, th- those types of things that may be again impinging on the uh, the very large veins, yeah. the very large pelvic veins that are you know the main thoroughfare of venous flow coming up from the legs. So we uh, we did our usual routine. I mean, after I talked to the guy for a long time, uh, after I um, examined him and all that sort of thing, our next step is usually to do ultrasound. Um, and uh, we did an ultrasound in him, and we found that there was ev- a prior or evidence of a prior, fairly extensive DVT in that right leg. So that we found out just by doing uh, the ultrasound. Now, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, because we are able to look at the entire leg, leg pretty pretty well with the ultrasound machine, we can't go up much higher than, uh, you know, the groin mm-hmm. in getting a, a good look at the, um, you know, the venous uh, flow and the venous structures. So, uh, you know, if there's, if there's a question about something higher, then we usually have to do something like a CAT scan sure. or yeah. an MRI, something like that that's going to do allow us to look, you know, into the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, and if we would have done a CT or if we would have done an ultrasound in this patient and we wouldn't have found a reason why he had so much more swelling uh, in the right leg than in the left, then we would have moved on to those things. We, yeah, we yeah. didn't because we felt like we kind of had found our our reason. So, uh, so what did we see on the ultrasound? Well, the uh, basically the entire femoral, what we call the femoral vein. That's the main, the main d- vein. deep vein yeah, in in the thigh. Yeah. Uh, was uh, was occluded. I mean, it uh, it it had again. It was it looked like an old blood clot. But um, you know, often the uh, the the body will break down DVT you know clots uh, such that it, what uh, what happens is that that vein will what we call recanalize. And that just means that uh, there's some amount of blood flow that will. Uh, that will start back up after that initial, you know, acute uh, thrombosis of a vein. Unfortunately, in him, he was one of the few people that uh, where that did not happen. Uh, the uh, the flow was, you know, still or the vein was completely occluded. There was absolutely no flow whatsoever through the vein, uh, and there were fairly prom or not fairly very prominent uh-huh. collateral veins that were. Uh, allowing for blood flow around that clotted area. Now, what are collateral veins? Well, collateral veins are sort of the, uh, you know, the surface roads from the highway. You know, when the highway is blocked, cars get off and they get onto the uh, surface roads. And uh, so uh, that's what happens in venous obstruction. You know, since the since the blood can't go th- go down the highway mm-hmm. up the uh, the main femoral vein, it's got to find a way somewhere. So uh, these collateral, uh, you know, uh, vessels develop, and that those are just yeah. you know branches of the veins that are there already, but they become dilated mm-hmm. because of the of, of necessity. Yeah. You know? And uh, and we call those uh, collateral veins. So he had developed a fairly substantial collateral veins. And again, this was just because of the DVT that it happened whenever. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly when it happened. Uh, but in addition to that, he had superficial venous reflux in the great saphenous vein and in the small saphenous vein. Um, and then he also had a very prominent, what we call posterior accessory vein. That's a vein that uh, we call it accessory because not everybody has it. He did. In him, it was very large. Uh, It's a vein that goes up and down the back of the thigh, uh, and it uh, usually extends from the area of the behind the knee and then comes up the back of the thigh and then kind of wraps around and and will empty into uh, the uh, great saphenous vein near the groin. Uh, so if it's there, that's the usual, you know, configuration. Uh, he had one and it was very, very large because probably 
it was part of the collateral flow from because his main femoral vein was blocked. It was occluded. Yeah, you know, one thing that I found very interesting, gang, over the years is that a lot of times a question will come up by you, and if you were going to ask this question, I'll just ask it for you, and that is, do you run out of veins? I mean, you know, how many veins can you have taken out before you don't have any veins left? Well, it's like what you're talking about. These collateral veins become primary. I right. mean, they, they get to a point where they're they're not just there in case they're there because they're going to be used at some point or other. Right. You know, so you never really, I, I mean, I'm sure that there have been some patients and sometimes that have had too many veins removed for whatever the reason. But that doesn't seem to be a big issue. That I, I've met a lot of really lovely uh Real older kupunas in your office when I'm there, and they uh, they've had treatment for years and they need it, but they they feel good, and that isn't mm-hmm. that the key. You go back when you need to feel good again, right? You know, right. Um, well, that concept um, is uh, you know v- very rarely do we run into a situation yeah. where we can't do something with a vein that is abnormal in its function. Yeah. And, and like you alluded to, you know, do you ever run out of veins? Well, t- typically no. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a very unusual yeah. and would be a very specific situation. There's lots however, of them there. Yeah. However, yeah. this patient, that th- this would be a patient where we do have to be concerned about that mm-hmm. because uh, this posterior accessory vein, it was not functioning normally. There yeah. was reflux in uh, that vein. Uh, but w- are we going to, we're going to think twice yeah. <laughs> before we intervene on that vein because uh, typically when we, uh, you know, the treatment that mm-hmm. we do for refluxing veins is to uh, to close that vein down we do you know what we call endovenous ablation uh to remove to eliminate those abnormal flow uh patterns but in him <clears throat> even though the vein was not functioning normally it was probably functioning as a, a collateral route yeah. from the lower leg up into the in, into the pelvic veins because his femoral vein yeah. was occluded so that's really in, interesting. These, you know, it's almost you can see the veins getting together in there and say, "Hey, look, this guy's not doing right by us. We have to do some things." <laughs> hey, buddy, you gotta, you gotta have another baby and you gotta grow. Because, yeah, you know, you're just needed. Yeah, you're needed exactly. elsewhere. Exactly. Yeah. So I went back to, to talk to the patient. He, he came in again thereafter, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I, I asked him, uh, you know, did you know? that you had a blood clot, you know, and, and he said, no, he, he never knew that he had a no. blood clot. Now, um, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it, it, we run into this, we, we run into evidence of DVT in people and they, you know, they don't, they didn't know it, they weren't diagnosed or didn't have symptoms or whatever. Usually those are fairly small, you know, you know minor kind of DVTs. Uh, not, not so much in this guy. This guy mm-hmm. really had a very, very extensive yeah. DVT. And, and, and I guess I, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure how he <laughs> either yeah, ignored yeah. the symptoms yeah. or, or didn't have symptoms that would, uh, would have allowed him to recognize the fact that yeah. something was going on, hey, but that you, very we, interesting. We, we've talked about that a fair bit, Doc. And, and by the way, Dr. Jewell is the medical director of Vein Clinics of Hawaii. It's available at Vein Clinics Hawaii 24 seven. Great website. Uh, but uh, we, we talk about that, you know, a, a fair bit, uh, and, and I think it, it really bears, it really makes a lot of sense as we become more aware of what we're talking about here, uh, that there's there's light at the end of the tunnel, because I do know that you throw your hands up in despair sometimes, and that's not the, quite the case to me. There's lots and lots of different plans that you can do, lots mm-hmm. of things you can Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, that that kind of goes to the point of, uh, you know, people recognizing that there's something going on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if if something feels a little abnormal, it probably is. Yeah. And yeah. you need to have it looked at. But uh, so anyway, um, he said no, he, he didn't, he had not recognized symptoms at some point in the past. The way that that clot looked on ultrasound, it looked like he had probably had that DVT quite a while before, mm-hmm. probably yeah. years before. Um, so you got lucky because some DVTs you can have a lot shorter period of time and they do a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, and in his leg, you know, again, this was the reason why his both, you know, each of his legs looked so differently was because of the uh, occluded, you know, yeah, femoral yeah. vein on the right side. So you know what? What do we normally do for DVT? Well, uh, this this is what he didn't have. You know, usually people we diagnose the DVT, those people get placed on anticoagulation. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and, uh, you know, depending on the extent and, you know, the situation and the patient and et cetera, et cetera, you know, we, we will, you know, always have them anticoagulated at least for three to six months, mm-hmm. maybe more, again, depending on the uh, specific situation. Uh, while they're on blood thinners, you know, blood thinners don't dissolve the clot. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people think they do, by the way, right? Yeah. A lot of their they yeah. think, well, just put me on a blood thinner, it'll thin it out. Yeah. You know? So, you know, blood thinners don't dissolve the clot. Are there medications that will dissolve clots? Yeah, but usually we don't. Those mm. those are used in very, very specific situations. But, uh, you know, blood thinners are used primarily to make sure that the clot does not propagate, does not extend, does not get bigger. Uh, and which is very, very important because especially in some of these, you know, very large, uh, deep venous blood clots, uh, Mm -hmm. if you don't put the patient on blood thinner, they can extend, you know, way up and create even more problems. Um, so, um, so the, uh, the, the blood, the blood's thinned out. It, um, you know, it stops the, uh, the, the uh, clot from propagating. And then over time, the body starts to break down that clot Mm -hmm. you know the clot uh what what we call retracts it's sort of uh you know uh, gets a little more compact uh the body does its thing and it sort of breaks it down and typically with a patient on a blood thinner they they will restore some flow through that yeah. vein so that the vein becomes at least somewhat functional. Now, so, so you weigh the risk when you prescribe it. You know, it's it, it, it's it's a good risk because the oh, outcome yeah. could be very, can be good. Sure. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. it is good. It's, it's definitely yeah, good. that's what I meant. So, um, you know, then, uh, but unfortunately, you know, especially in a fairly extensive blood clot, you know, the deep veins also have those one way valves, yeah. and the one way valves make sure that the blood keeps going in the right direction, which is upward, but you know, as a patient develops a blood clot, usually those valves uh, are either destroyed or, you know, uh, become very fibrotic mm-hmm. and non-functional. And, and, and unfortunately, even though there is flow in the vein, which is good, yeah, I mean, right. it, we, we, it's good to restore the flow, but uh, usually those veins do become incompetent and mm-hmm. uh, you, often there will be reflux in the vein. That's, you know, that's what usually happens. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, he, you know, he didn't have that. Yeah. He wasn't diagnosed. He didn't have the, um, uh, the benefit of being on an, uh, on an anticoagulant for some period of time, uh, nor did he get other, you know, recommendations. For instance, it's so very important for people to be in compression stockings, yep. uh, you know, during those, uh, very initial stages of, uh, develop, of having developed DVT, uh, also. So that helps, mm. you know, uh, helps the uh, the clot stabilize, uh, you know, to not non propagation, you know, that type of thing. So, uh, and it uh, it will diminish the negative repercussions that will occur with time in somebody who has uh, a DVT, and that's what we're talking about today. This post thrombotic syndrome that can be so debilitating uh, for many people over a lifetime, quite frankly. So, um, how do we then treat this patient? You know, where, where do we go? Well, um, we, uh, you know, this is, this is not a run, this is not a garden variety, uh, you know, uh, venous reflux type patient. So we have to, uh, kind of go through it in, in a very, uh, deliberate stepwise sort of fashion. Um, we're not going to make this perfect, Mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, uh, and you know, many situations are like that, but we do want to, you know, get his circulation, his venous, you know, the status to as good of a point as as we possibly can. And so, so what's the, uh, what, what did you decide? What were his options and what did you end up, uh, either recommending that he do or have already done? Well, we, he had uh, he had a superficial venous insufficiency in the great saphenous vein, in the small saphenous vein, and then in this very large in that big posterior accessory yeah. vein. And and as I recall, we we did you know uh, we treated each vein uh, in a stepwise fashion, mm-hmm. and then we allowed for some time to mm-hmm. go by, mm-hmm. so we would treat one vein. 
Uh, and uh, then he came back. I wanted to make mm-hmm. sure that he was tolerating it well, make sure that his you know, symptoms yeah. were actually improving, uh, which they did. And I, uh, I believe that we treated the small SAF and the uh, upper portion of the great SAF in his vein. Mm-hmm. We, didn't do, we didn't do anything to that accessory vein because going through the whole process, it seemed, it seemed to be, you know, by ultrasound and the way it looked and his, you know, leg, et cetera, et cetera, like that was, that was continuing to be mm-hmm. a major collateral, wow. a, a major source of, you know, blood transport from the leg back up to uh, getting back up to yep. the heart. Um, so, uh, so that's what we did. And, uh, and then of course we, you know, made sure that he incorporated compression, uh, elevation, yeah. you know, as needed and all those sorts of things. You know, gang, there is no shortcut when we talk about this compression. And, and I really appreciate the doc because uh, he knows. I mean, <laughs> and, and you, you specifically know when you tell a patient or when you show a patient, because I used to be one of that, I was that guy. They would say, yeah, but I wear them every day. Just didn't wear them today because I knew you were going <laughs> to see me. But, yeah. but in actual fact, um, if you, and I, I want to tell you, if there's one thing I've mastered, it's these stockings. And, you know, if, if they're too tight, if they're really a problem getting them on, or sometimes they can even be a problem taking them off, particularly if you've worn them for, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 hours when, you know, they, and if you don't keep adjusting them every now and again, especially down in the fold of your ankle and your, and your leg, yeah. it can be painful. Oh, yeah. I mean, because you're actually restricting blood flow when you're doing that. But it seems to me that if at first you can't tolerate, start with a lower version of compression and start getting a little bit used to it. That's the thing that I'm recommending for people now uh, like me that say, oh, I, t- I can't even put the dang things on, let alone keep them on all day. Yeah. You know? I th- I there's think lots that- of makers now, though, right? It's getting better. Oh, yeah. It's out in the mainstream. There's Everybody's all- wearing them. There's all sorts of manufacturers out there for sure. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that 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 is the key. You know, to start out with a little lower compression, um, I think the the key is to find to finding a stocking that that a patient will wear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because even you know, if they're not, even if it's not the greatest of compression, let me tell you yeah. another thing, and let me ask you about this because I may be asking this question on behalf of a lot of others that are saying, "Don't scold me. I'm wearing the dang things." Uh, but I I have found out on some days, and the bre- the the brand that I got from your office the last time. Um, that are a little bit less in compression. If you wear two pairs of them, yeah, it, it really is easier to get them on and take them off. And if halfway through the day uh, it's too tight, you can take one pair off and leave the other pair on. That's what I've been doing. Yeah, they're the thinner ones. I think that they're twenty thirties instead of thirty yeah. forties or mm. whatever the number is. Right. And 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 remind everybody again what those numbers mean. Yeah, that that's a range of uh, it's a pressure measurement, right? And uh, it has to do with the amount of compression that is present in that stocking. Yeah. Uh, and we give a range because um, the the stocking is uh, manufactured in a way yeah. such that the greatest amount of compression is down by the foot and ankle, mm-hmm. and then the compression you know gradually diminishes as you go up the leg. Uh, and the uh, the theory there is yeah. that uh, you know the, the, that pressure gradient, you know, yeah. lessening as it goes up is going to yeah. uh, facilitate you know excess yeah. fluid and whatever moving in the direction well, that we want it to go. Especially when you get it from the, it's coming from the very bottom, and it you know your body just doesn't you can't vacuum it up. It, 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 there's nothing sucking it up. It's got to go up. It's got to go up those little valves, and those valves are leaking. You got to get compression on them, and that's what I. That's right. the rationale that I use every day. Say, shut up and put the dang things on because they make you feel good. At the end of the day, you feel better. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the other key is, you know, so many people that have swelling, the swelling does go down overnight. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. if they're laying flat in bed, or even if they're, you know, in bed and you know, elevating yeah. their legs, uh, you know, the swelling will go down. Well, when you wake up in the morning. That's the time to put your compression stock yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you you cannot wait until it's, you know later in the day when you start way, to develop the swelling. Way harder. You, I, so, I yeah. will agree. Uh, but there's also some people have difficulty taking them off. Uh, if you don't yeah. take them off the right way, you can be in pain until you can figure it out. I knew one guy, 
and shame on him because they're not, you know, they're they're not inexpensive. They're a lot. By the way, they're a lot less expensive than they were. It's getting a little yeah. bit competitive. There's no more people right. making them. But this guy had to take them off with scissors. It, 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 it he mm. just couldn't stand it. Yeah, it, it, it wouldn't move in either direction. He couldn't get them up or down. So out yeah. come the scissors. There goes thirty bucks or whatever it was. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, we've we've heard that story yeah, before. Yeah, I yeah. bet. So uh, so anyway, that came as part of this guy's uh, uh, treatment. Obviously, uh, there there were more things, but that uh, certainly is, I, I hope, a, a regular part of his everyday routine now. Yeah, I, I think for him, the the basis, the basic steps were to treat his superficial venous reflux mm-hmm. uh, to the extent that we were able to, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, you know just incorporate. You know, the daily use of compression yeah. and elevation, and uh, and again, you know, this is, he had a complicated leg. There's no question about mm-hmm. that. We were not going to make it perfect, yeah. uh, but the uh, you know the standard uh, dictum is don't uh, do no harm. You know, yeah. Yeah. and uh, yeah, the last yeah. thing you want to do is make the situation worse. Sure. And sometimes, if you get too aggressive, you can do that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so anyway, this patient had you know, uh, the classic post thrombotic syndrome. And that's why I wanted to bring this, uh, talk about this patient because, um, it can lead to major problems that again are, are, are going to, uh, you know, be a, a problem for the, for the rest of his life, yeah, you know, for his lifelong. Yeah. And, um, so if you, uh, if someone is, there's such difference between somebody developing a DVT and, and, you know, being aware of it, getting it evaluated, getting it treated properly, uh, you know, being on anticoagulation, wearing the stockings, uh, there's such a difference between that and yeah. the situation where it goes untreated and uh, it can turn into, you know, lifelong problems. And even, so, even yeah. you know, there's an, uh, even in people who get treated for DVT, mm. some amount of them are going to develop this post yeah, yeah. syndrome. So you, you just have to be you know, concerned about, uh, you know, uh, treating it as, as, you know, aggressively as you possibly can. So, um, you know, so what is, what is it exactly? Mm-hmm. Well, the, basically the, the post-thrombotic syndrome is just the long-term problems that arise in the leg subsequent to DVT. Uh, and uh, again, this, this patient had all the signs of I mean, the, yeah. the usual symptoms are achiness, pain, heaviness, problems with sensation, and especially swelling as he had in, uh, you know, to a much greater extent in his right leg. You, you know, what I'd be curious about, and, and that uh, pulls for all you that are out there listening. By the way, you're listening to Vane Clinics of Hawaii. Dr. Randall Julef is the, uh, is the attending, uh, he's the head surgeon. And, uh, and it, it can be found on the web at veinclinicsofhawaii.com on four islands. Started actually on the big island. Came to Oahu last, but now we get them. And there's always a way to get treatment, and you want to go to the website and check it out. Because a lot of these things that he's talking about are, 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 are covered in this. And I, I think that when you do that, um, I guess when you say, you know, if, if you have a DVD and you, and you do get it treated and – Although it has a propensity to recover, if you're monitoring yourself well enough, you can probably cut it off at the past before it gets to be the bigger problem. How does that? How does that work? I mean, is it through ultrasound? Is it through just uh, noticing your symptoms? What is it that makes people come back and get rechecked? And how often should they do that? Uh, well, uh, you mean after they've had a DVT? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's a good point. Uh, once you've had a DVT, uh, would it be, would it be advisable for you to follow up with respect to that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, even those people who develop a DVT, they may uh, recover completely, uh, and they may not even have you know reflux, you At know, all. repercussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but probably it's a good idea to uh, you know have it have it looked at periodically, H- have them come in, talk about their poten- you know possible yeah. symptoms. You know, are they developing symptoms that may be consistent with venous insufficiency? Uh, and and doing a uh, doing an ultrasound to see if I- anything has developed. Uh, because uh, again, you have to be aware of the fact that once you've developed D- a DVT, your risk of a second DVT is even it's higher. higher. Sure, and and that's one thing I saw recently on a television ad at night, and it was for a medication, and and I guess that you know uh, I don't think there's a medication for a DVT, but there are some people that think there's medication after you've had one and not get another one. You know, and, and I don't know how much that is playing. I do know that we, we do know, gang, over the years, and Dr. Julev has been very candid in this, there are no 
advanced medication for vein disease. Mm-hmm. In other words, you're using a lot of medication, but usually you don't give somebody medication so that they don't get vein disease. Yeah, at, at least not at this point. I don't know, or in this country, I should say. I don't know about it other places. Well, there there isn't any uh, medication, oral medication either, that treats venous insufficiency. Yeah, yeah. There are some things out there that some people feel may uh, benefit the symptoms, mm-hmm. you know, sure. but it, it's not it's not going to impact venous reflux. Venous reflux is a mechanical problem, yeah. and, yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. usually it takes a mechanical uh, remedy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a medication that uh, restores uh, function to normal after the uh, after the reflux is there. You know, that came out one time. I, I had to laugh. This really nice lady friend of ours. I said to me, and she's a regular listener. As a matter of fact, she's been to your office. I'm not, not going to name her. But she did say that uh, the best way to get rid of tired and achy legs is is uh, wine. You know, you drink a few bottles of wine and then you're fine. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Isn't it sometimes funny, though, how there are, you know, old wives' tales remedies and things that really can exa- can make a matter worse? Mm-hmm. You know, you, yeah. you know we, we talked about this a lot. If somebody and somebody, some of you are out there. I already know this because I've met you and I've been you. And that is have a a cut or a hole or an ulcer that you don't know what even an ulcer is, but you keep putting you know neosporin and a band aid on some for three months and it doesn't go away. Well, I mean, what do you need to know? It's it's that's that's you're not making the you're you're not doing anything except making the problem worse. Yeah, you know, in yeah. the long run, there there must yeah, be something yeah, more yeah, going yeah, on yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, everybody thought all you need in this world is uh, some aspirin and some neosporin and some band-aids you know it's, you know there you, there are a few more little aids out there yeah yeah um which actually the ulceration brings up a good point and that is you know one of the reasons why we want to treat this you know situation so aggressively this post thrombotic syndrome is because of the fact that many people with this do go on to develop ulceration. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about this guy having uh, ad- fairly advanced skin changes. Uh, you know, the what happens is that um, you know with venous obstruction, uh, there's nowhere no no place for the blood to go, so it uh, it it increases the pressure within uh, the okay. within the entire venous system. Mm-hmm. We call that venous hypertension. Sure. You know, just yeah. like regular hypertension hypertension except that it's in the in the venous system and you know that uh, that hypertension then leads to uh the uh you know the skin repercussions that we see mm. uh, you know the uh there are inflammatory cells that leach out uh there are pigment cells that leach out into the skin and uh that's why the uh the skin becomes discolored mm-hmm. that's why the skin can become thickened irregular uh and uh and that's yeah. when the patient is the most at risk for uh developing an ulcer um which uh you know that's uh, that's the highest level highest clinical level for venous insufficiency yeah. is a c6 and, yeah and you know gang when you get there and that's where i am or it's where i've been uh i don't know if i'm a c6 anymore i guess uh you are a c6 when you actually have it yeah that you know then if you if you get it cleared up and it seems to be gone maybe you can drift back down to a c5 or or don't have to be going yeah. on to the next level but that's the whole point isn't it I mean, the point is to get proactive, and and I do know that one of the one of the things that if you're waiting for that skin to change uh, back to the way it was, uh, it's not going to do that in no. all probability. But no. but you can decrease the the additional deterioration, and that is that's the home run, isn't it? That keeps people able to do the things they want to do and not become couch potatoes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's that's a question that we get all the time. Even people with just you know the pigmentation of the skin from just venous insufficiency not even a dvt yeah. uh, or po- or post thrombotic syndrome but uh you know the uh, hyperpigmentation that comes along with vein problems uh you know the first question always is you know if you fix my vein issue yeah. is the uh, is the color going to go away and unfortunately yeah we always have to say no it won't uh very occasionally we see you know a, a little bit of lightning uh, of that, uh, you know, pigmentation, but by and large, most people do not get a yeah. substantial lightening. But the important thing is what you just mentioned is to treat yeah. the uh, underlying venous insufficiency mm-hmm. so that that process doesn't yeah. continue to get worse because you know, invariably it will. 
you know, and it seems, I mean, you know, right now, the way things are globally, travel is not on everybody's mind. But one of the biggest things or one of the many bucket lists people have on is that when I'm an empty nester and when the kids are all grown and the can- and the grandkids are all in college, we want to see the world. And that's when they are the most vulnerable for problems if they're, yeah. if they're not taking care of themselves. Because wanting to climb that rock or see that wall or something, if you've got uh, vein issues uh, when you're traveling, that's the last thing you want to blow up on you, isn't it? Right, yeah. right. So, um, so that's a big enough incentive, gang, for you to look after your legs. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, what are the risk factors for developing post thrombotic syndrome if you have had a DVT? Well, uh, first of all, is the location of the DVT um, and the uh, the risk of uh, post thrombotic syndrome? These advanced problems with the lower leg and the skin problems thickening and pigmentation. Uh, the the more the higher up the DVT, you know, as the DVT goes up goes higher into the thigh and even into the pelvis, uh, the more likely yeah. you might be to develop this post thrombotic syndrome. So, uh, you know, the the uh, the uh, lesson there is that if you have a DVT that's into the thigh, then you have to be even more concerned yeah, about yeah. getting it treated fully and being concerned about that over the long run so that um, you know so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. Uh, uh, if you've had a previous DVT, not only are yeah. you more likely yeah. to have another DVT, yeah. but you're also more likely to develop post-thrombotic syndrome. Sure, and that's what I'm worried about because a lot of times you want to curtail traveling, particularly long flights uh, where you're sedentary. And I do know that nowadays, that uh, particularly after the pandemic and everything else is over, our, our methods of traveling and all of that are going to be different. And so... One of the things that I do know that you you do get, Doc, on a regular basis is people asking you not necessarily for destinational advice, but travel advice. Can I travel? Can yeah. I be away? Am I okay to travel? How am I doing? Right. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, uh, oh, pre-existing venous insufficiency. So yeah. if you uh, if you have a DVT and you have had or you know yeah. have chronic venous insufficiency. Those people have a little more likelihood of developing uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, elevated body mass, you know, people who are obese, yeah. uh, they have a higher incidence of venous disease and yeah. all of the repercussions. Uh, and then older age also, as people get, you know, in their advanced age, yeah. if they develop a DVT, they're more likely to go on to uh, uh, develop post-thrombotic syndrome. So... Um, the, the main thing is, uh, you know, with respect to st- again, kind of getting back to the stocking thing is that, uh, in, in this would, this is, this would go probably for not only this situation, uh, DVT and post-thrombotic syndrome, but just, uh, venous disease in general, in general yeah. um, swelling is, is the, is the main evil, yeah, yeah. you know, swelling is the evil thing here. And, um, if you can control the swelling, then you really are going to be able to avert, uh, most of these, you know, long lasting and, uh, you know, major repercussions of, yeah. you know, skin problems, skin breakdown, chronic ulceration, et cetera, et cetera. So we really need to, um, you know, find a way to uh, control swelling in, in all of our patients. Yeah, and gang, you know, if you are in that category or, or a loved one is, uh, you, you just can't be an ostrich and ignore it and say, well, it's swollen because I'm tired. It's swollen I I had too much salt or I got the god or I got the hooper or I got something. No, you have a problem. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I think in, in some respects – Maybe sometimes people say pain is good. Pain tells you stuff. But swelling, even if it's not painful swelling, doesn't that also scream at you pretty loud? Oh, yeah. 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 Really loud. Yeah. It, it should be It should be very loud. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and unfortunate, well, unfortunate or unfortunate, you know, usually swelling is not painful. You yeah. know, the people can tolerate a fair amount of swelling. But, um, you know, so... Uh, you know, compression stockings, um, elevation. I mean, we talk about elevation all the all time. The time yeah. And, um, you know, we we kind of, I think when we talk about elevation, people tend to think, oh, you know, yeah, I'm okay, I'm going to elevate my legs or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But, but it really is a therapeutic endeavor because if you elevate your legs, and if you elevate them yeah, properly, yeah. 
you know, you really have to. By the way, elevating your legs is not tossing a small pillow under one leg. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and being and have your head higher than your foot. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, and and, and eleve. You're right. How do you yeah. define yeah. elevation? Yeah. Because uh, you know, there's all different, a whole variety of different ways that people elevate their legs that are probably yeah. not very useful. Uh, but, but yeah, you really need to have the, the legs above the level of the heart. Your body needs to be flat. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you incorporate, you know, it's, it's amazing how much swelling you really can control if you just incorporate elevation, you know, for a couple of, you know, times throughout the day, uh, along with compression stockings. Mine, mine seems to be very, very handled. And, uh, that, that being said, we're, we're at the end of another program. I want to remind you that you can go to the, uh, to the website, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. That's veinclinicsofhawaii.com and tell others about the show. Uh, I mean, everybody that you know somewhere is affected by uh, venous insufficiency of some sort. So the quicker you can get yours sorted out and diagnosed, the better you are. So thanks for listening. We'll see you again next time. Aloha. Well, that's our program for today. And we certainly hope you enjoyed meeting us. Please come back next week for our next episode. And in the meanwhile, to learn more, please visit our interactive website, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. That's veinclinicsofhawaii.com.